so much for joining us for our first webinar in the student success series. If you ever find yourself kind of feeling pressured to be more productive or to finish more tasks, this webinar is going to be perfect for you. We're going to be going over a ton of different information, including the difference between time and attention management, tips and tricks for being a student, and how to make the most of your valuable time and energy. Now, today we have a stacked speaker lineup featuring our webinar favorites, Dr. Amy Dietzman, Evelyn Sullivan, and Sarah Snyder. So without further ado, I'll pass it all on, on over to them. Thank you, Maxine. Welcome, everyone. We have put a lot of time, hopefully efficiently, into building this presentation just for you. We're excited to have the opportunity to share with you what we know from research and from personal practice about how to work more efficiently by working more effectively. During our presentation, we're going to be touching on these topics, the familiar concepts of time management and multitasking, the potentially new concept of attention management, how and why to avoid procrastination, how to use your state of mind to your advantage and how to control your environment, effective strategies and routines you can utilize in helping you set priorities, and the ever-present importance of taking care of yourself and balancing the demands on your time. So let's go. Productivity. The world is dominated by the need to be productive, right? What are you accomplishing? Are you producing? How much are you producing? And it goes further than that. Not only are you producing, but how efficiently are you producing it? Are you producing as much as you can during the time available to you? And how emotionally draining is it to realize that you're coming up short? You can do more, be more, produce more. <clears throat> One of the best strategies I ever learned was putting first things first. And I'm definitely putting it to use in my life right now. I am currently in school working on a certificate program in theology. And at the same time, I'm married, working full time, have two energetic boys, ages six and two, and I still need time to feed my family. I've realized that I do my best work, or at least my least distracted work, in the morning before my family wakes up and everyone in my life starts asking me for stuff. So I've developed a very dependable routine so long as I follow it. I get up at 5 a.m. to study and do homework for a couple of hours every day before everyone else wakes up around 7.30 and the day starts running away from me. I'm running around like crazy between work and school and kids for the rest of the day, get dinner made, get the boys to bed by 8, and tuck myself in by 9.30 every night. Did you catch the every day and night part? I really do mean every day and night. Saturdays and Sundays start and end the same way too. I've found that as much as I love sleeping in on the weekends, it's simply not worth the cost of throwing off my sleep and wake schedule for the rest of the week. With this routine, my Mondays are no harder than my Fridays, as long as I maintain consistency. <clears throat> Research shows that one success leads to another. The motivation and positive energy associated with accomplishment creates a springboard for continued accomplishment in other tasks and areas. One part of my routine I didn't mention is that I also make my bed every morning when I get up. That feels like a little tiny who cares about a thing, right? That hasn't always been part of my morning, but I can say with certainty that it has improved quite a few areas since I started doing it. For one, it's so much nicer to climb into a made bed at night. And for two, I've already accomplished something within the first couple minutes of my day. That feeling of accomplishment, like I mentioned before, how little it might be, starts to build that springboard of energy. Think about what you do first every day. Is it the most important thing you do in the day? What about when you get to work every day? You may not think you're doing the most important thing first, but you probably are. At least you're giving what you do first your most important time. Maybe getting up at 5 a.m. won't work for you, but can you get up an hour earlier than you do now? Can you use your morning time more efficiently? Can you build in a sleep schedule that you can count on every day? Our willpower is the highest in the morning. That's why if you feel <clears throat> excuse me, if you really feel something is important, you should do it first while you have that willpower to get it done. It means work tasks, school tasks, exercise, whatever it might be. But I get it. Some of you are saying, 
No way. I am terrible in the morning. I am not a morning person. Well, that's okay. Night owls are still successful so long as they know their strengths and weaknesses and give themselves time and space to do what's important. This is where your habits and discipline gets to shine. You can still create your space for your schoolwork, but you need to be much more disciplined because other commitments and distractions will creep in and steal your time. So if you say you're going to study between 7 and 9 p.m. each night, you're going to have to stick to it. Remember, one success leads to another. So that also goes the converse. It can be true that one flop leads to another because it sets you behind. If you're working and going to school, you have to be disciplined and very scheduled. This means that homework is done at a certain time. You eat dinner at a certain time. You go to bed at a certain time. If you don't have a routine yet, you should build one, think about building one, that you can ensure makes time for all the things that need your time. Consistency is key as you are constantly reinforcing to yourself and those around you that you're committed to those things that you're doing. So what's tricky with time management as a productivity tool? <clears throat> the whole concept of time management assumes that we have some control over time. I don't know about you, but regardless of how it, I might change the clock, the time is still the same. Time management also encourages you to set a specific time of the day to work on a specific task. For schoolwork, you may set that time a week ahead and that's great, but what if your energy level isn't where it needs to be when that time comes? Time management says, well, do it anyway. Your willpower and self-control diminish with every decision you make throughout the day. With time management, we set a specific time to start a specific task. I'm going to work on my English paper at 2 p.m. this afternoon. But when I made that decision, I failed to take into account how mentally drained I was gonna be at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Time management is a great tool for something without variable energy, like a computer. But for people, it's very unforgiving. So that's why time management can be coupled with attention management. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But first, I wanted to go into multitasking. Think about the following multitasking scenario. You're working on a project for class. You spend five minutes working on it before you get distracted by your phone. You jump over to your phone for five minutes. You suddenly remember, oh, I was working on that project and you jump back. After another five minutes, you're back on your phone. You just can't help yourself. This can go on and on. Did you know that it takes an average of 14 minutes to get back to focusing on one task after having been distracted for, by another? So think about that. If you're switching back and forth every five minutes and it takes 14 minutes, you're not getting much done. So as a result, multitasking actually impedes productivity and slows you down. What? I'm doing two things at once. How can that make me slower? Bear with me here. Going back to our scenario, I've reached the end of an hour that was supposed to be spent working on my project. What have I accomplished toward my desired result for that hour? Probably not much. Maybe 30 minutes of that hour was actually spent working on the project, if I'm lucky, not even considering that 14 minute focus angle. Uh, now I need to put in another hour of work to make up the other 30 minutes that I was supposed to do that I lost to my phone because I know I'm going to lose half of that hour to my phone too. And that's not even that's not even taking into account the fact that I probably never achieved an actual focused state each time I switched back and forth. <clears throat> Multitasking also impairs executive function. What is that? Well, executive function is the mental process that allows us to make decisions. It allows us to focus on the task at hand, plan out a sequence of events, juggle competing priorities, and remember instructions. There are two executive function stages we need to go through when switching between tasks. The first is goal shifting. This is a decision to change focus and decide to do something else instead of what you're doing right now. And the second is rule activation. Every task has a set of rules. So changing tasks also means setting down the rules of the first task, reorienting yourself and your mind to the rules of the next task. 
When we multitask, we overstimulate our brain through our task switching to the point that we diminish our ability to do the things we need to do to make effective use of our time. Each time we shift our attention between, say, our phone and our project, for example, we're putting our executive function through those two stages. And then every time we switch our attention back, we're putting it through those two stages again. Additionally, we may be requiring ourselves to change our state of mind, something that we're going to talk more about in a moment as well. Did you know that multitasking also lowers your performance quality by increasing your mistake rate? Because you aren't giving your tasks undivided attention, you are at an increased risk of forgetting where you left off skipping a step, neglecting to give adequate attention to detail, and so on. You've compromised your ability to do either thing as well as you could if you remained focused on each one individually. If you devote attention to one thing at a time, you're less likely to lose sight of where you were in the process. And multitasking can also increase feelings of stress. Now, I'm not saying that multitasking is solely responsible for any stress you may be feeling, but I am saying that as a result of impeded productivity, slowed progress, impaired executive function, and lower performance quality, all those things we just talked about, you're giving yourself ample reason and opportunity to feel additional stress. It takes longer to get a single thing to the point of completion, and that means it's going to take longer to actualize the positive feelings of completion. Research shows that multitasking, especially making a habit of it, can even damage your brain function and your memory. You can become more easily distractible, lose the ability to focus or concentrate deeply, and impact your brain through the increased stress or anxiety. It can kill your creativity because creative thought requires focused thought, which might sound counterintuitive, but creativity blossoms in the absence of distraction. There's even research to suggest that multitasking reduces emotional intelligence, that ability to perceive, control, and evaluate your emotions. Hey, to prove my point even further, we're going to try a little activity that one of our teammates taught us. <clears throat> what I'd like you to do is go to the chat here in the meeting, and we're going to try a little exercise. Type in the word multitask. No hyphens, just multitask. I'll go ahead and participate too. Okay, now type in the numbers one through nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, next. I want you to type the two by alternating. M, one, U, two, L, three, and so on, until you get to the end. Okay, which was faster? Doing them each separately, or alternating back and forth between the M and the one and the U and the two. My gut says that you will all agree with me that it was a lot easier to type the word multitask by itself, to type the numbers by themselves, than to keep alternating back and forth, keeping track of where did you leave off with the word multitask when you're putting in your numbers. So if time management isn't the answer and multitasking isn't the answer, is there another option to help you get more out of your time? I believe that there is. So we're going to look at something called attention management. Psychologist Adam Grant defines attention management as the art of focusing on getting things done for the right reasons, in the right places, and at the right moments. The goal of attention management is to keep people focused on important and relevant tasks while avoiding distractions in order to maximize productivity over time. It takes into account the human factor and the individuality of the person and the task. So let's take a closer look at the pros of attention management. 
<clears throat> Attention management empowers your productivity by doing a few things for you. We just explored one of the primary flaws of time management, the illusion that we have control over time. If you've figured out the secret that allows more than 24 hours in a day, please share. But until then, let's focus on what we can control, our attention. At any given moment, we have the ability to control what we pay attention to. Attention management also allows us to be more proactive than reactive. Choosing to manage our attention minimizes the effect of outside influences deciding for us when and what we focus on. Instead of living a life of reacting to and being distracted by all the things happening around us, we can live a life of choice and intentionality with our attention and focus. Last, attention management focuses on marrying task completion with motivation and energy. Your motivation to do different tasks is going to change throughout the day. Use that to your advantage and pair up tasks with energy in the most effective way. So how do we do that? We wanna save the more intensive or dreaded tasks for when our motivation and energy are high. That might be in the morning, it might be after lunch, whatever your energy looks like throughout the day. It might sound counterintuitive. Shouldn't I do the things I love when my energy is high? Well, actually, no. Those tasks that you love have their own energy level that comes with them. As a result of their enjoyment factor, it helps carry you through. The assignments for the classes that you love might fit in that category. The same goes for easy tasks. You don't need a lot of energy to complete an easy task. So knocking it out while your energy and motivation are low is a good pairing of energy and task type. This might have your mind moving to the idea of putting things off until later. So I'm gonna hand it over to Amy, who's going to talk to us about procrastination. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. So we do need to move on and talk a little bit about procrastination because we can make excuses for having low energy and needing to do other things, but we still have to address the fact that we have due dates. We have a tendency to put off the things that we don't feel like doing, of course, and procrastination is probably the biggest issue that students face. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to work ahead in your classes. Why? Well, because life happens. When I was in grad school, my husband broke his leg on a Friday. I had a huge paper due that Sunday. Thank goodness I had my paper mostly done because that weekend was complete chaos. He needed surgery. We were back and forth to the hospital across town. And when I brought him home, I had to wait on him hand and foot. I would not have been able to write that paper if I'd waited until the day it was due. My students always, always have trouble with this. Every single week, someone loses internet right around midnight when the papers do. Someone gets sick. Someone has an unexpected emergency. Not to mention, we may be wrestling with low motivation and energy on some days. So that's why working ahead is so important. Also set small goals. Think of pulling weeds. I hate pulling weeds. But if I have 10 weeds to pull, I would be more likely to go out and pick 10 weeds than if I looked at my yard and I had 300 weeds, right? Same for you. Rather than looking at a big assignment and getting overwhelmed by it, divide it up into smaller tasks and tackle one small thing at a time. Today, I'm gonna to read some articles. Tomorrow, I'm going to outline my paper. The next day, I'll write my introduction and so on. And be accountable. There is no magic bullet to procrastination, which people always ask me, other than just sticking to the work, developing a routine, being consistent, and holding yourself accountable. People who procrastinate the most are those who aren't organized, aren't disciplined, and consistent, and who can easily be distracted by other things because they aren't organized and consistent. So when you set aside time to do schoolwork, you just have to do it. That's really the only secret. You have to do it. Do your best to use the same schedule every week, no matter what is due. So you stay in your routine. Now, I know that sometimes you work different schedules and that can't always work, but it's still best to always set aside time. Some weeks you might use the time to work ahead. Some weeks you'll be a little more under the gun. Sometimes you'll have flexibility to move things around a little bit based on your energy. 
but be consistent by doing a little bit every day. Work ahead and you will believe that you can do it. So a couple statistics, 80 to 95% of college students say that they engage in procrastination. So if you're one of these, you're definitely not alone. 75% consider themselves procrastinators. They actually say, I am a procrastinator. And 50% procrastinate consistently and keyword problematically. Procrastinators don't see it as a strength. People don't usually say, I'm a procrastinator. I'm proud of it. So I liked to work ahead because then I would give myself some time to reflect. Have you ever worked on an assignment and then walked away from it and thought, oh, I should have added this or I should have written it like that? If you procrastinate, you don't have the luxury of walking away and reflecting on what you just did. So why procrastinating is bad? Well, students who turn in assignments at the last minute tend to get lower grades. That's an actual proven researched fact. Procrastinators are often afraid of failing. Maybe that's why they procrastinate. And procrastination increases stress, depression, anxiety, and fatigue. Yikes. And not to mention your guilt. When you think you're going to work on an assignment on Wednesday and you don't start, you don't do it. So then you start to feel a little bit guilty on Thursday because you still put it off. And then you feel even a little bit more guilty on Friday because you still haven't do done it. Just get rid of the guilt by doing things when you set out to do them. So think about a time when you had a large daunting or uninteresting, possibly, assignment that really needed to get done. I'm sure we've all been here before where we're trying to get through that assignment, even though our energy and our motivation are at an all-time low. It's pretty painful, right? It makes the task itself seem so much worse than it actually is. And it can leave us feeling defeated when we've tried to accomplish it and made no progress. Not because it's too difficult, but because our energy and our motivation are too low. What do you do on those days when you're making no progress, but you still have a due date, and this is the only time that you have to get it done? Here's a couple things you can do. Take a little break, go for a walk, get some fresh air, listen to a little music. Then look at the assignment and break it up. Is there some part of it you can do productively right now that doesn't require too much energy? Can you switch tasks altogether and do another assignment that needs to get done and move this one to a time when you believe maybe your energy will be higher? So let's think about this a little bit more. To understand ourselves and our motivations better so we can manage our attention more effectively, we first need to understand the four states of mind that we can find ourselves in. Our first state of mind is reactive and distracted. And now this is the state of mind we are most likely to find ourselves in these days. The world's more interconnected than ever before and demands our attention and focus, whether we're at work or school or working or doing school at home, whether we're with our children or we have the luxury of sometimes to ourselves. In this state of mind, while we may be desiring to focus, we don't have control over our environment. We're being bombarded by little distractions like email pings or being interrupted by a family member or a child. This is our multitasking or task switching state of mind. We're reacting to what's happening around us and allowing it to distract us from what we're working on. So the next state of mind is focused and mindful. This is almost the complete opposite of the first. In this state, we're consciously concentrating on the task at hand. We are being intentional about channeling our attention into one thing. In this state of mind, you've taken steps to ensure that you aren't interrupted. Maybe you've closed your email or you put a sign up on your door or you put in your earbuds. You're actively engaged in pushing away distractions that you know are lurking. Then we go into the daydreaming state of mind where we really aren't doing any of the things that I mentioned in the, either of the first two. But in this state, we're letting our mind wander wherever it wants to. We aren't directing our attention to any one thing, but we're still actively blocking out those distractions. This is those in-between moments where we aren't focused on anything in, in particular. We aren't filling time while we're waiting for an elevator or standing in line at the store or sitting at a red light. This is an important state of mind, though because it helps us to unleash our creativity. 
We are actively avoiding distraction, but it's so our mind can do what it wants rather than putting all of our concentration into one task. This is where we solve problems, think of new ways to do something or have those light bulb moments. So daydreaming is good. And last, we have the flow state of mind. And this one's really interesting because it isn't one that we really have any control over. You can't really force yourself into the flow state of mind like you can the others. Flow is that state of mind where you are completely losing yourself and what you're working on. You get so absorbed that you shut out parts of your brain, distracting you with things like how you feel or maybe what's for lunch or wondering what other, other people are up to. It's just you and the task. Generally speaking, this is going to happen when you spend a good amount of time in that very first one that, or that second one, that focused and mindful state of mind. That's where if you can get yourself there, flow might come. With any luck, you'll transition into a state of flow where you aren't having to work so hard to actively push out distractions. So attention management is the ability to identify your current state of mind and change it to the one that's going to best serve you in that moment. It's also the ability to recognize your own state of mind patterns. Is it easy for you to move into that focused and mindful state in the morning or in the afternoon? Do you allow yourself to enter into a daydreaming state? Or have you convinced yourself that if you're not doing something, you're not being productive? Use that knowledge about yourself to adjust your approach to your day and your task list. And no, attention management does take practice. So throughout your day, take a few moments to make note of your state of mind and what has pulled your attention away from your task. This can help you recognize your distractions and work on eliminating them. And it can help you recognize your state of mind to become better at shifting into a more appropriate one for the task at hand. You might find yourself wondering, what can you do with these efforts? Well, let's talk about managing your attention and controlling your states of mind by controlling your environment. Remove distractions. Don't let them control you. Forbes suggests that you should create a list of all the activities you're planning to stop doing in order to become more productive. Tasks that aren't contributing to your personal and professional goals. Any unproductive habits that you need to ditch, et cetera. So prepare a not to do list based on that self analysis and work on incorporating those changes in your daily routine. Think about your energy levels throughout any given day. Similar to the concept Sarah shared about being more inclined to be a morning person or a night owl, we all have times of the day when we have more energy or less energy and concentration available for focusing on a task at hand. Try to limit the amount of information that you're taking in. Research shows that giving children too many choices between toys can actually result in them being less engaged in the choice that they finally make. Information overload occurs when we're trying to make a decision, but we have more information than we actually need to make that decision. The mind can be a strong distraction in and of itself and has as much as we might wish, there is no way to completely separate ourselves from our thoughts and our heads. Relaxing the body and mind can help you put your attention where you need it to be. Maybe even let yourself daydream for a few minutes before you dive into something required, requiring focused attention. Stop multitasking and strengthen unitasking muscles with a 20 minute rule. Try giving one thing your complete attention for 20 minutes before task switching. As you get used to that, try moving to 30 minutes. This gradual shift will help train your brain to be more productive and effective and less easily distracted. Be intentional with your time by batch tasking. That means setting aside time to go through a batch of emails, for example, instead of doing one or two emails at a time all throughout your day. Let yourself get into an email rhythm by setting aside blocks of time to manage email. And work to build new habits. The book Atomic Habits by James Clear provides a framework for building new habits with little steps. In the context of attention management, building new habits around moving, removing distractions can help you control your environment more effortlessly over time. The more habitual something becomes, the less energy it takes to continue it. 
and last, take breaks and reward yourself. You can give yourself time after reaching a mini milestone, but set a timer and get back to it when the timer is up. Without limiting your reward, all you've done is intentionally introduced a distraction. So we've looked at a lot of definitions, a lot of pros and cons. I know it's a lot of information. We've touched on things you can do to be more productive, but I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Evelyn, who's going to take us through some more practical applications. How do we apply all of this stuff to our life as a student? Take it away, Evelyn. Great. Thanks, Amy. We're focused. We're intentional with our attention. Now let's talk strategy. I'd like to zoom in more on what day-to-day -day planning and prioritization could look like. First, recognize that prioritization will become a skill set. Give yourself permission to experiment and forgive yourself if things aren't perfect right away. Just try it and give it time and one day you will have a system down for setting priorities. A lot of people don't know their priorities. Well, if you confuse what is a priority with what is just a distraction, you will waste time, all the time. You may have heard of Stephen Covey. He wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and that's where this graphic came from. He says that people who have mastered time management understand where their priorities fall and spent their time in Q2, being effective and efficient with their time. Note that Quadrant 2 still leaves time for recreation and creative thinking. It's not all work. Some people spend a lot of time dealing with Q3 tasks and confusing them with Q1 tasks. They think the tasks are important when they're not. And this is why Q3 is called the quadrant of deception. Many times the urgency of these tasks is due to other uh, priorities or needs and not yours. A good way to dif differentiate a Q3 task from a Q1 task is to ask yourself, is this task related to my goals? Is this task going to get me closer to graduation? Is this task going to help me get a better job? Q4 is called the quadrant of waste, and for good reason. It contains all your time wasters. A lot of people have a tendency to hover around quadrant three and four. After resolving their Q3 tasks, they enter autopilot mode and spend all their time in Q4. This can be because they have nothing better to do or they're procrastinating on the things they should be doing. Quadrant four creates no value in our lives whatsoever. And note that the word excessive comes before relaxation, TV, gaming, and internet. It has to be excessive to fall here. A good question to ask yourself if it's excessive is, did that just keep me from doing something I should be doing? Do I feel fulfilled now that I just spent four hours on Snapchat? If your answer is no, you probably need to cut it down. Whether mapping out a larger goal or constructing your to-dos, you'll want to make a plan. Themuse.com has a great article on productivity in which they suggest breaking down every task into small steps, then scheduling everything by starting from the end of the day and working backward. This means you'll know exactly what activity you'll do from the moment you wake up. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it removes the time and energy spent making decisions, and that can be liberating and keep you on track. By removing decision-making, we're likely to maintain our willpower to get things done. It takes energy to make a decision. And as we make decisions throughout the day, even decisions about things that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things, we have less and less energy. And if not managed properly, we can burn out and then our willpower will suffer. Allow enough time for each activity. If you use an online calendar, plug in time for each task. Try 30 to 90 minute blocks that are labeled what you'll be working on. When you start your day, look at the calendar and make a call on your energy level. If you put studying in the morning but you're not feeling sharp yet, take a more enjoyable task like finishing touches on a project you love and swap. Be flexible, notice how you're feeling and adjust. I find that by task blocking, it also helps to minimize distractions and I could single task. Attention management, right? Accept that priorities can change. Sometimes we get interrupted by a new project or life event that takes priority. This is natural and okay. 
Just shift what you can and know that you can revisit transplanted priorities later down the line. Priorities can also change because we want them to, and that's empowering. So we've talked about being mindful about how we function at varying times of day. Well, what does that look like in your week? Let's say Tuesdays and Thursdays, you have class time and lab work. You can use some time on Mondays to adjust and plan your calendar to set yourself up for a successful week and then block out focus time to work on projects Wednesdays and Fridays can include time spent tying up loose ends and planning for the next week. Build your study time short-term homework assignments, and break time around your classes, classes, obligations, and weekend plans. Schedule your priorities. Okay, let's think about this. Let's say you have a pile of to-dos to get through in a day, and you look at the pile and you say, okay, first I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do that, and then I'll do that. Essentially, you're prioritizing your schedule. If instead you take a slightly longer view, you can schedule your priorities. In this case, you have a wide span of time, let's say across a whole week. You schedule the most important items first so they can maintain top priority for your focus. And then you can fill in the time with those less important or less urgent tasks. We'll talk about balance a little later, but I highly encourage you to prioritize time for yourself that is not work or school related, from breaks in your day to taking whole days off. Eat the frog. Please don't eat any actual frogs. Author Brian Tracy introduced a concept he calls eat the frog, inspired by a quote by Mark Twain. If the first thing you do in the morning is to eat the frog, then you can continue your day with the satisfaction of knowing that this is probably the worst thing that will happen to you all day. In terms of effective living, this means complete the hardest task first. You'll get it out of the way, you'll feel awesome that you did it, and now you have easier items left to complete. Habit stacking. I'd also like to talk about one of my favorite concepts discussed in James Clear's Atomic Habits, habit stacking. The idea is to take an existing sequence of habits that you already have and insert a new habit. As Clear explains on his website, you may already have a morning routine that looks like this. Wake up, make my bed, take a shower. Let's say you want to develop the habit of reading more each night. You can expand your habit stack and try something like wake up, make my bed, place a book on my pillow, take a shower. Now when you climb into bed each night, a book will be sitting there waiting for you to enjoy. Create an emotional to-do list. This I found kind of funny. Um, entrepreneur Robin Scott suggests thinking about how the to-dos make you feel and categorizing them as such. For example, you can list a task like finishing a paper under massive relief. Relying on good habits and routines is one way to conserve your willpower. It's so much easier to stay on course when all you have to do is look at a list or look at your calendar and complete what's right there already decided for you. As Sarah mentioned before, this also means having strict and clear rules about certain things such as when you'll go to sleep, when you shower, when you exercise, etc. Set your schedule and map out exactly what you're going to do. You're more likely to complete something that's difficult or less enticing when there are no unknowns and no decisions to be made. Also, think about where you can buy time. What can you delegate or outsource? I couldn't tell you the last time I did my own laundry. If I had a washer dryer in my apartment, I'd do it myself, but I don't. So for me, it's worth the extra 10 bucks or whatever it is to not have to sit in a laundromat for two hours, fold everything and come home. It could be the same for you and grocery delivery or meal kits or house cleaning. Attention management is vital to productivity and efficiency, but remember, it's not all about to-dos. You can't pour from an empty cup, so it's equally important to set aside time to do the things that re-energize you. First, go outside. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit this can be a challenge. We live in the day and age of Instacart, DoorDash, and Amazon. There just aren't a lot of scenarios that require me to leave my apartment. 
but I'm setting aside time to do so because going outside improves concentration, creativity, and even provides a healthy dose of vitamin D, which is crucial for a functional immune system, healthy cells, strong bones, and reducing inflammation. And according to HuffPost, research published in the Journal of Aging Health shows that getting outside on a daily basis may help older people stay healthy and functioning longer. People who spent time outside every day at age 70 had fewer health complaints at age 77 than those who did not go outside every day. And don't forget to exercise your body and mind. Walking is great. It's free. It's easy. You can also stretch, try a sport, take up a dance class, or practice yoga, even if it's from your living room. Yoga with Adrian is my personal favorite yogi, and you can find free classes for all levels on her YouTube channel. And don't forget to flex the muscles in your brain, too. Take some time each week to learn something new, even if it's just a few minutes a day. Pick up reading, solve a puzzle, or learn a new language. And lastly, socialize. Reach out to a friend for coffee. Have a regular standing coffee chat, even if it's virtual. Volunteer for a cause you're passionate about, or help organize something for your community. As a student, you may be tempted to put off your work until the weekend, and then you may have to skip some social events. But if you plan properly and finish your work over the course of the week, you can make sure you always leave Saturdays free or whatever time free to hang out and have fun. Lastly, an evening routine can help wrap up the day, set you up for restful sleep, and even take some prep work and decision making out of your tomorrow. Lay out what you'll wear. That's one less decision you'll have to make in the morning. There are quick and easy breakfasts you can prep beforehand, overnight oats, chia seed pudding, egg muffins, breakfast bars. Pinterest excuse me, is a great resource for meal prep ideas for breakfast and lunch. Write down your to-dos or any important reminders for tomorrow. The idea being, if you get it out of your head and onto paper, it's not swirling around in your mind, keeping you awake. Consider journaling if you really have a lot you'd like to clear out. And if you're journaling or if you use a planner, review, refresh, and assess your goals. And while you're at it, why not celebrate the day's successes and write those down? If you want to practice gratitude, you can jot down or say something you're grateful for. And lastly, it is important to wind down. What will help you relax? Is it reading a book, a cup of sleepy time tea, listening to a bedtime playlist or meditation, doing some relaxing yoga poses in bed? Whatever your routine, aim to go to bed at the same time each night, allowing for seven to eight hours of sleep. And with that, we have many resources that we've uh, referred to over the course of this presentation that you could feel free to check out, including some yoga playlists <laughs> um, on YouTube for free. And with that, I will kick it back to Maxine for any questions that you might have. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys so much for this presentation. There's a ton of really great information in here uh, that I am jealous I didn't have this back when I was in college or high school. Um, but before we get to the questions, um, as you can see on the screen, this has a lot of our social media uh, links and all that kind of stuff. I highly recommend you follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, the reason for this is you'll be far more aware of what other webinars we have going on, and YouTube is where we put up all of those recordings. So if you aren't able to join us uh, one week for the webinar, no worries. It will be on our YouTube playlists over there. Now, um, one of the questions that we got was if this PowerPoint was going to be shared afterwards so that people can look through those different resources that will be uh, included in the follow-up email. So again, just keep an eye out for that. It will be coming out in the next couple of days. Now, uh, Evelyn, one of the questions that came in was around flexibility. Um, and if there was such thing as being too flexible, um, and if, the, if so, what are the warning signs and how can you kind of prevent that from happening? Okay, as I'm understanding that is being too flexible in that you maybe give yourself too, too much free time and you go off track or something like that? Uh, yeah, so it was kind of underneath the making a plan portion mm -hmm. where you're talking about being flexible and moving things around. Yeah, I think... You know, as I mentioned, 
it's all going to become a skill for you. There's going to be a long, not necessarily a long period of trial and error, but there is going to be some experiment experimentation that needs to happen. So you could just try it out, block out time, see if you're able to consistently, you know, move things around based on your energy level and, you know, just, just see what works. Um, a lot of times I'll have the flexibility built in there because, you know, from a work perspective, I could get pulled into a meeting that I'm not expecting to get pulled into, or someone could need help with a project and I'm not expecting it to. So I, to me, having that flexibility is an added layer of security that, okay, I made time to prioritize these items. And as long as they get done, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily matter that they get done at 3 p.m. and at you know 4.30 p.m. this day. I just have to make sure to get to them. All right, definitely. Another thing that kind of comes along the lines of having too much on your plate or people constantly bringing things up to add to your plate. Mm -hmm. um, and if there was uh, any advice on how to kind of politely say no to somebody when your plate is full and you're not able to take on an additional task or project. Ooh, I'll take that one. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that one because we are going to do another webinar coming up on uh, communication and confidence. And we do talk about assertive communication and how you say no when you have too much going on. I will say when I was a student, and I'm not talking about working um, for, for a boss that asks me to do things, but when I was a student, I said no to pretty much everything. And I just made it clear to everybody that, you know, I'm working and I'm a student and I'm a mom and I just am going to not be able to do some things for a while. My kids knew, my husband knew, you know, I didn't volunteer to be classroom mom. I didn't volunteer to do, uh, you know, go on the field trips and do all the extra things that I just couldn't do. And I just told myself, when I'm done with this degree, I'm going to do all these things, but I can't for right now. And I was at peace with that. So that's one thing is just to let people know where you are where you are in life. But as far as telling no to your employee, that's definitely going to come up in that in that next webinar, which is actually next week about confidence and communication and how to be assertive and uh, let people know where you stand and when you do have too much on your plate. So I hope we can help answer some of that there. Yeah, that's good. Can I add one thing to that? Yeah. <laughs> just, just to in a small way, actually answer the question here. One thing that I have found particularly helpful is if I have a lot on my plate and someone wants to put something more on my plate, I'm, th I'm speaking of workplace plate, is to be able to go back to them and say, okay, you want this, but it's going to cost this. Like, if you really need this to be on my plate, here's what I can also make happen. I'm going to have to say no to something else that's already on my plate. I'm just kind of laying it out for them and giving them a clear understanding of this is what my bandwidth can afford. And so if you want to add this thing, then something else has to give. And that can be really helpful for the employer perspective that get a clear view of what you actually have going on and then they can help make those decisions about which one is more important. Yeah, help you prioritize. Yeah, that's great advice. Awesome. Yeah, we also had a couple more questions come in. One specifically, I know uh, a specific book was recommended multiple times or brought up multiple times, but what books would you recommend on time management and building habits? Absolutely Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, I believe there are several other books listed in the resources of this presentation as well. Um, yeah, we can take it. There we go. Yep. So the 5 a.m. Club, I know that was a book study here at work. Um, positivity is pretty great. It's not necessarily about um, habits and consistency, but more about mindset and having, having a good mindset going up against big challenges. I can put in a plug for the 5 a.m. club too. That's part of why I get up at five o'clock was that bug, book study that we did here at work about it. It goes into a lot about how to plan your time in order to make it be productive. So that's that can be really helpful if you're looking for something about time management and then Atomic Habits. 
I second Evelyn's recommendation for building habits. It's an amazing book. Perfect. And yeah, again, everybody, this uh, basically the PowerPoint will be shared so you can take a look through all the different resources. And then another thing, another question that kind of came up was what tools do you recommend to track accountability on this page? I already see a little uh, section called tools, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit more about those and if there's anything else you'd recommend. I mean, it can be as simple as like tying reminders to your calendar if you use like Outlook or some kind of calendar to plan your day online. Um, just so, you know, ding, the little reminder comes up and you're like, oh, time to work on this right now. Um, also, if you're a visual person, they have, you know, on Pinterest is a great resource for digital, um, really cute digital calendars, meaning like, okay, here's all of the days in February, you could have them and then maybe put a, you know, a, a digital gold star sticker every day that you do something. And once you see that streak happening, you don't want to break that streak and be like, oh yeah, every day in February I did this thing that I want to do. There's also quite a few apps. I know that uh, in the past when I've done uh, time management webinars, I've recommended things like Habit Tracker. That's an app you can get. Um, there used to be one called Habit Bowl. I don't know if there's if that one's still around. There's also some different uh, goal trackers you can use, like use like Strides is a, another app. But if you just go into your app store of your whatever device you use and type in, you know, tools for students or accountability tools or habit tools, you're going to find a lot of different apps for, you know, there's an app for everything now, and that might help you to, to find something that works for you. But I know that between the three of us that are speaking to you today, I, because we all work together, Evelyn and Sarah and I are also, we we're really, really good at keeping our calendar up to date, color coding our calendar, making sure we um, block time to do certain things like we talked about a lot in this presentation. So we, I don't really use any other tools other than my Outlook calendar, but I did use different things when I was a student. So I would say definitely look into what's out there in your app store. I would say something too, as far as a mental tool that you could use, it's maybe not something for your phone or your computer, but I saw a question about consistency. And I know uh, kind of along the lines of the combination of consistency and accountability, one of the things that helps me get up at five o'clock, which I will say I'm not perfect about it. There are times when I sleep till 5.30 or six o'clock. But one of the things that happens is I have that mental conversation with myself about what is this gonna cost me? I need to make sure that I'm aware <clears throat> of the cost of sleeping in an extra half hour or the cost of staying up an extra hour late to finish the movie instead of watching only half of it tonight and half of it tomorrow night. It's being aware that there is a cost to the choices that I make and then knowing, okay, if I sleep in an extra half hour tomorrow, I have to get up or I'm going to get behind those kinds of things. And if I can just say one more thing to that, I, I know we came across as like, you know, you have to be so disciplined and you can't do these things and you have to do these things and schedule out all the hours of your day. And I just wanted to point out, this is a student success webinar. And so we're really talking to you as students, assuming that many of you are also working and have families, and there's a lot of things that you have to schedule in your day. This is not a lifetime thing. There are times in your life when you will not have to schedule out every second of your day. But as a student, because it's so hard to do all the things, that's why, you know, it sounds like I may be a little overwhelming to some of you, like I'm, I've never done that before. But just remember, it's a finite time. And being a student, if you do it well and you are disciplined, can go pretty quick. And then you move on to another stage. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys so much for all, answering all those questions and for this fantastic webinar. Um, again, it does look like we're kind of coming up on time. So just as a reminder, there will be a follow-up email that will include the PowerPoint, a recording of the webinar, as well as information to register for next week's webinar, which was talked about here. 
Um, and we hope to see you all there. But again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day.